Hello, and welcome to Addressing Health Literacy with African American and Latinx Communities, Event 2 in our four-part webinar series on tips and tools for closing the digital divide. My name is Brittany Thomas, Associate Director of the Network of the National Library of Medicine, All of Us Community Engagement Center, and I will be your host for today's event. The Network of the National Library of Medicine is proud to be partnering with Wisconsin Health Literacy, the Black Greek Letter Consortium, STEM Queens, Latino Academy of Workforce Development, Milwaukee Public Library, LGBT Plus Detroit, Generations Online, and the American Association of Health and Disabilities to offer this webinar series to learn about health literacy insights, best practices, and available tools designed for meaningful and effective engagement with diverse populations. Before I introduce today's moderator, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. This event is being offered through Zoom webinar, YouTube Live, and Facebook Live. Captioning is available. If you're watching this in Zoom webinar, you may access captioning in English and Spanish via the links available to you in the chat. In YouTube, you can turn on captions in English by clicking the CC button at the bottom of the video. To turn on captioning in English on Facebook, Select the down arrow in the upper right corner of the page. Select settings and privacy. Then select settings. Then select videos in the left column and select the drop down box next to always show captions and choose on. Please mes message us through your platform's chat box if you need assistance finding captioning or if you have any other technical issues. We are recording this presentation with closed captioning and we'll be posting this recording on NNLM's YouTube channel. We will send out a recording of the panel to all event registrants within one week. Although you are muted, your participation is important for today's learning outcomes. Throughout the event, please use the chat box to post questions and comments. Our presenters will respond to as many questions as possible during our time together. Finally, at the close of today's program, you will be redirected to our online survey. Please take a few moments to share your feedback. For our NNLM members that are interested in Medical Library Association continuing education or the Consumer Health Information Specialization, you must first complete the online survey before receiving instructions for how to obtain credit for your participation. Now, with great pleasure, please allow me to introduce you to today's moderator. Caitlin Mallett is the project manager at Wisconsin Health Literacy. Caitlin has nine years of experience in nonprofit organizations, including work in health literacy, healthcare communications, and community relations. At Wisconsin Health Literacy, Caitlin focuses on managing grant funded projects on safe medication use, opioid pain medication, health insurance, and digital health literacy throughout the state of Wisconsin. Caitlin, thank you so much for joining us, and I will now pass it over to you. Thank you, Britt, and thank you everyone for joining us today. We're going to open the floor for our next discussion as we welcome two guest speakers. They will share information about their organization and the communities they support, along with addressing tools and resources they've found to be instrumental when talking about digital literacy and breaking down barriers to improve equitable access and use of online resources. Joining us first, with my pleasure, is to introduce Julio Garcia, Director of Education at the Latino Academy of Workforce Development, an agency promoting general education, digital literacy, ESL courses, and workforce training for underserved communities for 10 years. Joining Latino Academy reconciled the two paths Julio took previously, education, and social justice. He came into the US for graduate studies at UW-Madison, where he taught language, literature, and culture courses before joining the Tenant Resource Center to promote social justice through equitable access to housing resources for tenants. At the Latino Academy, he is in charge of coordinating all levels of GED courses and English as a second language classroom. 
We have provided his email in the chat box if you wish to contact him following today's discussion. And further ado, we welcome you, Julio. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for your kind words. And yep, I'm happy to share whatever it is that I know with, uh, with anybody that is listening. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today we are going to be discussing some of the particularities in regards to health literacy uh, with the Latino community. Uh, I would say like many of them are the same as other communities. It's uh, topics and uh, issues that uh, are intertwined with all the other communities, but there are like some particularities that I would say are very specific to the Latinx community and that we should take into account when we are like a, thinking of how to address these disparities into health literacy and how to access the health, uh, the health system here in the, in the US. And I would like to start because I, I just went and looked uh, look up a definition of uh, health literacy. So I, what I found, uh, I found two definitions in two different uh, 20, 20 years apart that are pretty similar, and uh, you can probably read them. It's uh, obtain, process, and understand the basic health information and services to make appropriate health decisions. It was changed a little bit uh, recently to the to uh, address the use of information, not just getting the information, but how that information is used to inform health-related decisions and actions. I would like to go back to these definitions that are pretty broad, but something is uh, called my attention when I, when I was reading it. It's the decision-making, and we will deal with that in, in a little bit, but I think it's important how, to, how that decision-making can be understood in different ways for different communities. So uh, first I would just like to uh, mention some of the factors that may influence uh, the health literacy among the Latino populations, especially thinking of uh, immigrant populations that are coming into the US and many of them are the same that uh, are gonna be uh, topics uh, or issues that are going to be concerning for other communities. And as I said, all of this is going to be all, many of them come together because uh, some, uh, if you have like a low education level, uh, your income is going to be lower, your access to healthcare is going to be lower. So there are like many of these things are all like intertwined together. So I would say some of the issues particular to the Latino community, especially the immigrant populations, is the English literacy. How much English they can understand. Because I know and I, I think most of the healthcare providers do a good job providing uh, interpreting services for uh, communities that uh, whose English is not uh, for whom the English is not the first language. But there are like many factors that go beyond just uh, putting words in English into placing them into Spanish. There are many other like issues in the background that need, need to be addressed in order for that communication to be effective. And in this sense also, I would like to point out the immigrant generation of the, the person in particular. I think that's very important because it's not the same if it's like the a, a first generation newcomer to the US, a second generation that is probably completely bilingual and probably has been uh, performing the role of, a, of an interpreter for family members or a third generation that is probably more assimilated and in many respects would be associated with other communities. So what, what I want to emphasize here is that I would say that every individual, uh, there are like so many factors influencing like every single individual that we need to take into account that we cannot uh, have like an overarching idea of what's the Latinx community or how it affects the whole of the community. And if you wanna make the parallel with uh, our recent elections, when we were like, if you were following the elections, we were hearing all the all the time talking about the Latin, the Latino community, the Latinx community, and I would say like for us within the Latino communities, the question was like, okay, what's the Latino community? Like uh, if people support one side or the other, like there are many other factors 
for which like being Latino, it's not the main factor to make that decision. And it's the same, I would say it's the same with healthcare. You have like many factors that influence the way you are gonna be accessing healthcare. And I would like to point out two of them because I think they are like a particularly crucial to understand or to be able to communicate healthcare to Latino uh, Latinx populations. And it's, I would say like, uh, as I was saying, this communication beyond language. Okay, I would say like a, in access to interpreters is for the most part, or at least in some areas, it's not a problem. But there is something that, that this communication beyond the use of, of words. And this is when I want to go back to these health-related decisions that is part of this definition of uh, health literacy. Uh, many of us who come from foreign countries, our experience with healthcare is completely different from what the one you have here in the US. And I, I would say, speaking of myself, it was really extremely hard to navigate the healthcare system here in the US. On one side, it's all this idea of uh, the cost of healthcare, that you are always scared of doing anything that is a little bit out of line because you don't know how much, what the economic implications of that is gonna be. On the other side, there is the how communication occurs between the doctor and the patient. Many of us in the from Latino communities uh, or the experiences in our own countries is that uh, basically you have a problem, you have a health concern, the doctor has an answer for that for that problem. So that's usually how healthcare is navigated. The doctor tells you what you have to do and you do it. Uh, coming into the US, the system is completely different. Like a doctor is not gonna make a health decision for you. He's gonna give you the information so you make your own health decision. So there is a very a huge disconnect between both those expectations in the conversation. Me, I'm expecting the doctor to tell me what I have to do because he's the one who knows. And the doctor is not gonna make that decision for me, probably because of liabilities. Among, among other things. So there is this huge disconnect that uh, this communication is operating at two different levels of the conversation. So many times you need to bridge that conversation. And that's many times the, the role of the interpreter is not able to bridge that because the interpreter is supposed to interpret every single word, to put it into another language words. But that is many times it's not enough to conceive or to convey all the meaning of that conversation. So I think that this is something like very important that you need to take into account when uh, trying to transmit information to, I would say in particular, the Latinx community. There might be, there is something beyond words that needs to be breached in order for that communication to be effective. Okay, and the second topic I was I wanted to emphasize is the topic of the I called it like the information battlefield, but to make it more dramatic. Uh, but I would say it's pretty much it's it's that it's uh, the life of, of life or death issue, and this uh, has been emphasized or has been like really brought to the surface even more by the COVID nineteen pandemic because it's a, a fight uh, between different understanding of uh, where the information comes from to the community. And I, I emphasize the role of Facebook and WhatsApp uh, in, in this because those are like basically the motors of information. Because when we were preparing for these talks, we were talking about accessing good information, about uh, having websites that are uh, available for people to obtain that information. But the reality of the situation is that people don't go to those websites. They are available, but m even many times they are only in English, or if you make a search in Spanish, you are, those are not the results that you are gonna find in your search engines. So uh, with Facebook and WhatsApp, there is all kind of information that is uh, getting into people's minds. Facebook, I guess it's more like 
overarching, like every community is subject to the kind of information or misinformation that could be found on, on Facebook. WhatsApp probably for the American mind is not so well known. So it's just basically a chat system in which you could just basically send, send text messages probably with your family abroad many times. But the kind of information that is distributed through those uh, through those networks, it's basically impossible to control. There is no way to control what your aunt or your uncle or your cousin is sending you, what kind of video they are sending you with what type of information. And uh, during this pandemic, it has been incredibly disheartening to see the kind of information that is being distributed through those means. Uh, just for as an example for everybody to understand, usually you would get a video from your aunt, uncle, or whoever, a six minute video with somebody in a lab coat using some kind of health related lingo that sounds probably that uh, medical advice, but when you just look into it, it doesn't really mean anything at all. And people are bombarded with that kind of information. So many times uh, it's really extremely hard to counteract that kind of information that people are receiving. And that's, uh, it, it's, I don't, I don't have a solution for that. And I would like if we can go to the next slide and the, and the following one, I can show you like a real life example that happened just this weekend. Okay, was, that's what uh, here at the, at the Latino Academy for us, communication was really hard when the pandemic hit. So we have to create a Facebook group, a WhatsApp groups in order to communicate with our classes, our classrooms in order to centralize information. It's not ideal, but it's the easiest and most effective method. So this, this just happened, what you see on the screen, this just happened this last, last uh, Thursday, uh, Saturday, sorry. It's just like a message in, the, in between the whole conversation about the class, if I can attend or not class or when the class is gonna start, somebody forwards this message that it's about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine that is being checked for these uh, problems it's having. So it's just like thrown in there in the middle of the conversation. And the thing highlighted in there is the, the fact that it's affecting women between I think 18 and uh, 40, uh, 48 years old. So this is the kind of thing, and what is mostly worrying is that forwarded that you can see in there. This obviously is gonna be sent, this person is sending all this information, I guess with the best of intentions. I'm not gonna doubt that, just to uh, make people informed of what is going on. But this is like, recent probably to every person in her contact. And this is constantly, this is the bombs, bombarding that I was saying, like all these messages are coming from everywhere. And uh, depending on all those factors that we were talking before, like a educational level, like a literacy, both in English and Spanish, it's very hard to all how to conceive of all these messages. And just like the ideas of, on how to counteract this, I would say in a sense, probably operate at the local level and create these, I would say figures of authority, not, I would say not understood in the sense of like hierarchical authority of, oh, I know more than you, so you can only listen to me. The sense of authority in the sense of credibility. Okay, if somebody within the community is saying something, I'm gonna believe what that person is saying. In the Madison area, we have the Latino Health Council that is doing a huge effort in these areas with uh, radio programs, uh, events, uh, for, for people to get together and get some health information. And again, it's not easy because you cannot bombard people in the same way as they are, they are being bombarded by Facebook or WhatsApp. That's, that's the big issue. But that's, that's the only way to be able to counteract all these uh, messages that are coming from these unreliable 
unreliable sources. So it's like the idea of creating like a network of information that can be trusted. So those are like uh, basically my the things I, I wanted to share with with everybody because I think it's important if anybody is dealing with the Latino community to have those all those ideas in mind. And I would just like emphasize just to close like the fact that whoever every person is different don't understood like the whole community the community as a whole like uh, the, their experiences their life experiences how they got to this country how what kind of access or information they have it's going to be all those factors are going to create just an individual so i think that's important to conceive that and to adapt the communication to the what you are seeing from that individual how to make that communication effective so I, that's what I have to say. If, uh, if there are any questions, you can like put them in the chat and we will discuss them after Willis's presentation. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Julio. And thank you for sharing that example of how relevant social media has become in health information that is being presented. Now, this is absolutely an area that needs to be explored and researched to provide community members with information on how to navigate the misinformation, misinformation that's being presented. So thank you for sharing that. It's very important. Um, and we are excited to have joining us next is Walisha Jenkins, co-CEO of STEM Queens LLC, professor of computer science, health disparity, informatician, and biostatistics statistician. Wylesha Jenkins completed her master's degree in biological and biomedical sciences at North Carolina Central University in the Health Disparity Informatics Research Program. While at NCCU, Ms. Jenkins developed the Metabolic Syndrome Research Resource, also as known as MET, M-E-T-S-R-R, towards identifying novel sex and ethnicity differentiating biomarkers of metabolic syndrome. It was during this time that Ms. Jenkins developed a love for informatics and data science. At Fisk University, Ms. Jenkins serves in various roles, including curriculum developer, instructor of computer science, and bioinformatics laboratory manager, her greatest impact has been felt in the experimental redesign of curricula providing biostatistical support on research projects and manuscript writing. In addition to co-funding her consulting firm, STEM Queens, Ms. Jenkins is an active toxicity outcomes and risk assessment research fellow at the EPA. It is a pleasure to have you here, Wailisha, and welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Caitlin. I'm so excited to be here um, to share something, information that's near and dear to my heart, which is how to establish very effective health-based interventions in the Black community, so thank you. Uh, this presentation is a collaborative effort uh, between STEM Queens LLC and the Delta Research and Educational Foundation. Uh, the talk is entitled, What's Inhibiting All of Us? Examining the Origins of Low Health Literacy in the Black Community and Exploring Methods to Combat Them. Uh, so really to grasp the disconnect and understanding the cause of low health literacy and these contributing factors, it's important for us to evaluate all of the many reasons that marginalized groups have this disconnect. And there's several things that contribute to that. You have historical medical mistrust, we have compounded disparities that we experience in our community, uh, like Julio alluded to in his talk in the Latinx community, community compounded disparities are experienced. Um, also the structure of the intervention. So a lack of consistency and sustainable style of the interventions introduced into the black community. And also the one size fits all approach. Uh, so let's dive right in. Uh, when we think about historical medical mistrust in the black community, a lot of our minds automatically gravitate to 
you uh, the Tuskegee syphilis study uh, conducted by the US Public Health Service. Uh, this was a 50 to 60 year study for those of you who are not familiar where uh, the low income and illiterate black communities in the South were targeted by biomedical resource researchers uh, and told that they would get free health services uh, to be treated for bad blood when in actuality they were being injected with syphilis in order for these researchers to conduct long-term studies to see the effects of syphilis um, in human subjects over extended periods of time. We have um, other instances in our history, over 400 years of our history in this country of exploitative biomedical research that contributes to this mistrust. So if you look at the uh, historical medical mistrust slide, you'll see uh, the father of gynecology, uh, J. Marion Jones and his uh, Sims, um, J. Marion Sims and his Sims speculum and prototypes for this speculum and various types of gynecological sur uh, surgeries were experimented on on enslaved Africans at that time. A lot of them left uh, these experimental surgeries with long-term health effects, um, and many of them left barren following these uh, experiential surgeries uh, that he conducted. We see Rollins Edwards, a World War II veteran who was uh, one of the many Black soldiers that uh, was forced to participate in mustard gas studies. Uh, similar studies were conducted on Vietnam veterans experimenting with LSD as treatment for PA PTSD and things of that nature. Uh, we see a familiar beautiful face, Henrietta Lacks, uh, which is a woman who went to John Hopkins University Hospital in 1951 to be treated for a malignant cervical tumor, uh, where uh, unbeknownst to her, a doctor by the name of George Gay took a sample of those cells. And over the past 70 years, her cells have been used to uh, be the foundation of a multi-billion dollar biotechnology industry. So, uh, <clears throat> Even in, in recent years, in 2016, when I had my son, I was heavily recruited to include him into these eugenic-like studies where they wanted to explore uh, the long-term behavior of African-American boys, uh, particularly the, the um, expression of aggression over time. So, so these types of exploitative uh, studies and these invasive and sometimes abusive experimentation in the Black community is not some type of myth or story of long times past, but rather a very relevant reality that contributes to our su suspicious of, um, uh, interpretation of interventions that are introduced to us. Uh, and these uh, suspicions are further compounded by systematic racial disparities that we experience in our everyday life when it comes to baseline health care. So data indicate that Black people experience a differentiation in treatment and diagnosis when being compared to whites or other other racial groups. Uh, they're less likely to believe when describing symptoms of morbidity and things of that nature. Uh, so this conscious and, um, well, sometimes conscious and mostly unconscious bias expressed by some medical professionals um, is then compounded um, and associated with other uh, confounders of health, other areas of disparities that we experience in the Black community and contribute and reinforce this mistrust. So it's, it's no secret that there's systematic discrimination and racism as it contributes to um, socioeconomic status um, and contributes to limited access to education and resources and jobs. So we know these things to be true. And we also just know at the statistical level that there's a positive correlation between socioeconomic status and education. And there's also a positive correlation between education and health literacy health literacy. So as we see socioeconomic status increase, we see better outcomes in education. As we see better outcomes in education, we see better outcomes in health literacy. And the, the uh, audience or the communities in which you want to serve are suffering under that strong arm of discrimination and have limited resources in that area. So it's very important to understand that fact uh, before you introduce your interventions. As we talk about our next point, a lack of consistent and sustainable interventions. So what I mean by this is that oftentimes the, the inept interventionist does not quite know or understand the needs of the community 
prior to introducing their intervention. A, a lot of times there's inaccurate or inappropriate needs assessments done uh, before health-based interventions are introduced, which affects the uh, sustainability of that intervention. Uh, lack of community involvement in the organization of the intervention is another key component that reduces the sustainability and consistency of these interventions being received within our community. Um, insufficient community resources. At times we like to introduce these uh, opportunities um, when there's not sustainable resources provided in the community to uphold those. So especially when we're talking about health literacy and closing that digital gap, it's important to do these needs assessments to be sure that there is an open public library within the community that you are willing to serve and that those libraries have functioning computers um, and you know strong and secure internet connections. Those types of things are, are very important for you to understand because if you do that research ahead of time, it gives us the confidence that you know about our community, you know the challenges we face and the resources we have and you tailored your intervention towards that. Uh, many times the interventions are not sustainable because they're just too short. Uh, we all have good intentions when trying to make a difference in communities of need, but oftentimes a two, three day, one week, two week workshop is not enough to close the divide when it comes to something as systematic and compounded as health literacy in the Black community. So it's very important to be aware of these things even prior to introducing your intervention or gearing up to get started. Uh, another issue uh, that I want to point out is the one size fits all approach and Julio did a great job of mentioning that you know every individual that comes to this country from the Latinx community uh, has all of these factors that contribute to who they are and such is similar within the black community everybody has their story and so a lot of times it's very easy for the interventionist to take universal health communications and things of that nature because it's very convenient to reuse use information that's been curated for you. However, that leads to very unsuccessful interventions within the Black community because we cannot accept what we don't identify or relate to. So it's very important to acknowledge that this one-size-fits-all approach um, is not very well suited for any community, but uh, specifically for the Black community, speaking as a, a Black person, um, it, it, it very much so reduces um, the level of trust we have with the interventionists if a lot of the resources they use are generalized to the entire population because the reality of our experience in this country is that our experience is very much different um, and there's uh, lots of disparities that uh, make up our experience uh, that are very different from other groups, um, even other marginalized groups. So that's very important to acknowledge and reflect in your intervention. Um, so how do we address these barriers? How do we overcome this systematic these systematic challenges um, to um, these um, uh, introducing these health-based interventions in the Black community? Well, one of the key things is tackling that medical mistrust. Also, although the resources you're looking to dispense are around health literacy and closing that digital divide, medical mistrust is something that's embedded in an active reality in the Black community. So we first must acknowledge that, yes, this has happened. Medical mistrust has occurred and still may occur. But these are ways in which you can empower yourself to not suffer or minimize the possibility of you suffering abuses as it pertains to health. So um, making sure you showcase responsible research initiatives like all of us, um, using the tools provided by all of us like the data browser and incorporating them into learning activities to show that, okay, if you're looking for uh, accurate or responsible health information, here's one resource you can use, and here is how we can navigate that together. This is an organization that, although conducting biomedical research, is conducting research that's important to your community. Because as the, as the Black community, you know, we want to know what's going to help us right now. How are how is this research or what you're sharing with us going to improve our quality of life now, not five years from now, but right now? So it's important to uh, showcase that. 
Uh, there are responsible health research initiatives and overall health initiatives out there that are tackling concerns of the Black community and that uh, you can use these resources to then empower yourself to make better health decisions. Uh, in addition to this, this is one of the most important things is finding out who holds the keys and Julio did a great job of alluding to, you know, this being very important in the Latinx community as well. Uh, when it comes to many marginalized groups, especially the black community, um, no matter what uh, propaganda tells you or the media shows you, loyalty and trust is extremely important when you're looking for buy-in into interventions or any type of health-based um, training you're looking to introduce. So finding out who holds the keys HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities are a very, very solid and important resource for you. Not only do HBCUs have a cultural and traditional relationship with the black community, they also share a geographical relationship with the black community. 99% of the HBCUs that you'll find across the country are located in the center of a black community. So it's important to tap into the resources provided on campus, uh, not only the um, professors Professors and instructors there. Um, there's organizations on campus, but oftentimes the students, the students oftentimes have to complete volunteer hours for various reasons, and they can be a great resource to go out into the community and be um, an intermediary or a liaison for you. In addition to that, aligning yourself with um, uh, faith-based organizations. Faith is a very foundational keystone in the Black community, even still today. So identifying community stakeholders and faith-based organizations within the community you're looking to serve is very, very important in establishing trust within the Black community, uh, which will allow us to acknowledge and, and um, increase the possibility for receptiveness of your intervention. Um, Aligning yourself with other organizations that already do community outreach engagement centralized to the Black community, like the Delta Research and Educational um, Foundation, is very, very important because a lot of these organizations have done legwork for you. They've established connections with um, community stakeholders and advocates uh, that you can use as a resource. And oftentimes they're willing and desiring to collaborate with more people, more boots on the ground to really make a difference. Um, STEM Queens LLC. Um, uh, we conduct uh, research keen on the Black community specifically. So identifying these organizations and collaborating with them to interface with the Black community on your behalf and further help you curate your initiatives uh, to be more specific. Um, more, most importantly, especially at this time in history, uh, aligning yourself and identifying social justice organizations in the Black community in which you want to serve. Currently, the Black community is experiencing a lot of turmoil around racial injustice in the country. And uh, you cannot isolate these things when you're thinking about closing the digital health literacy gap or any type of health-based intervention or gap that you look to address within the Black community because we are a global organism. Our mental, spiritual, physical health are all connected. So the social justice initiatives being spearheaded in many Black communities across the country will provide you with key advocates that can really help champion your cause and help you design uh, interventions that are sustainable and can help you make um, a lasting effect. Um, so moving on, um, another important thing that you can do as the interventionist after you tackle the woes of the system is to constantly evaluate yourself, evaluate your intentions and your motivations. That is extremely important because we must acknowledge that we all come from different backgrounds, all have different stories and all have our own unconscious or implicit bias. So it's important to ask yourself, have I truly connected with the needs of the community? Have I performed a needs assessment to see if the intervention I'm looking to introduce is even suitable for this point in time in this community. Um, using your community stakeholders and collaborators, as I mentioned in the previous slide, using them to identify previous interventions that did not work. Getting that feedback from the community, the boots on the ground to hear, hey, last time someone came in, they tried this, eh, it didn't go over so well. Maybe you should come in from this angle. Um, find out what's been effective, what has been successful, um, and kind of mimicking and mirroring those activities. Also, looking at your retention. If you see us come back, 
then that means we have bought in. We are not going to waste time. We are busy in the world of survival right now as the Black community. So if we come back to your intervention, then what you are doing is working. And that's something you should, you should focus on those key points to enhance and then mimic as you begin to matriculate and move through other communities with the information that you're looking to share. In addition to that, it's very important to be specific and intentional. Again, universal resources, our, our health communication resources are very uh, great. They're easy to curate, and you can really dispense that uh, information in a quick fashion. However, once you receive that, as the interventionist, it's important for you to be specific to the community that you want to serve, to curate culturally relevant and tailored material, utilizing the collaborators that you've identified in the community, including them in creating, you know, um, any type of um, uh, resources with a storytelling aspect or a musical aspect, things that traditionally have been used in Black history to relate information, incorporating that in your style of intervention and using community members to participate in them. That'll contribute to buy-in. If we see people like us in the materials that you share, that'll increase increase the, the buy-in into the intervention you're looking to propose. Um, again, avoiding the data dump. You don't, um, and I think Julio alluded to this as well, you don't want to first give our community information that we don't want. The needs assessment is extremely important. And then once you do identify that, okay, I have this health-based communication that they do desire, it's important for you to make sure that you allot the appropriate amount of time to introducing that intervention. And that starts with establishing the trust. And then that starts with curating the material that's culturally relevant and specific. Um, and also knowing your audience within the Black community, there's uh, different demographics. So how you would design resources for the elderly in the Black community will be very different from how you present and curate resources for Generation Y or Z in the Black community. So it's important to avoid just dumping the same data on all the different groups within the community and to really tailor your intervention to be uh, long lasting and very specific. Moving on from there, the key component to making your intervention sustainable is empowering and enable the members of the community to uh, recreate the intervention that you're introducing, to train them up for each one to teach one, to show one another. Uh, that's going to be the most sustainable intervention. Many times within the Black community, people come in with the best of intentions to share information, or sometimes they're very candid and honest that they're there just for data and just want to get what they can get and go about their business. Um, and, and that's okay. But um, if if you're really looking to do something sustainable and long lasting, it's important that you actually train and empower community members that you want to serve um, to execute this after you're gone. Because we all know as we go into these different communities to share and to teach, we can't stay there forever. So if you truly want to make a lasting difference, you want to empower the community to empower themselves. Um, so just relevant overall takeaways, just know that you can make a difference. I, I champion and support all of you who are looking to take on this great task and this great work, because if people like us don't do it, then the uh, disparate outcomes and the disparities that we see across the board in healthcare will just continue to perpetuate themselves. So I champion you to know that you can make a difference, know your motivations, stay in touch with your motivations and your passions as it pertains to participating in this type of work. Be sure to conduct needs assessments to be sure that the intervention that you're introducing Producing is wanted and desired by the community. Identify and establish connections with people that live there, that remain there, and that are invested in improving the global health of the community members. Um, curate culturally relevant resources. Be specific and be very, very genuine. Uh, because my mama always says, you know, you, you can't trust everybody further than you can throw them. So, you know, it's very important for you to be genuine because we can identify if you're being who you are. And that's what will allow us to embrace you. And once we've embraced you in the Black community, we will then embrace the information that you want to dispense. So beyond that, that's all I have today. Uh, my contact information is here. Uh, STEM Queens LLC and the Delta Re uh, Educational Research Foundation would love to collaborate you, with you and help you curate these culturally relevant resources should you need them. And I'm excited to hear your questions and responses. Thank you so much for this opportunity, everyone. Thank you, Caitlin.
Great, thank you, Alicia. That was wonderful. And a great point about tailoring resources and interventions for our audiences. That is a lot of what we talked about yesterday about the guides being created and the videos, um, including diverse voices and resources. So, and thank you also for giving that deep um, and important background on the historical medical mistrust. I can say for myself, I learned a lot. So I, I appreciate you starting us off with that. And then, um, you know, to capture, you both really hit on an important message about this is not a one size fits all approach when we address digital divides um, and introduce these health interventions, like we're talking about this week on health information online and the all of us tools that are available for participants um, listening today to use. So you, you both did a fabulous job of capturing that and some just great strategies on how to personalize and customize these health interventions going forward. Um, so with that, we are now going to open the discussion for questions from the group. And I encourage you to just take a few moments, think about that. We'll keep the dis discussion going here for the remainder of the time. Um, and it looks like we do have a couple questions coming in to start us off. Um, so can you, um, Alicia, can you help us answer this question on what is being done to gain trust in the black communities in relation to health? I think now is a very special time in history because the black community has been put on the national stage for not so great reasons, but it's also kind of invigorated um, many black entrepreneurs, researchers, scientists, people across various domains to get invested and start to reach back into the black community. So I think if you just troll social media, you will find that there are a lot of community-based organizations that are looking to um, empower the black community in, in the area of health, uh, health literacy, uh, financial empowerment, because as I mentioned briefly, you know, a lot of people in the Black community are in survival mode, and it's hard to consider uh, the different confounders of health when you're just trying to put food on the table. So there's a lot of communities um, or uh, organizations that are working to address all of the concerns at, uh, of the Black community globally, which in turn will free up our, our time and our energy to focus more on ourselves and our health. So I think that if you troll social media, you will find that there's a, a lot of organizations that have, have kicked off. I'm sure if you just type in on Instagram or anywhere, just anything starting with Black, you'll see <laughs> a long list of organizations start to populate. So I would say that there's a lot of uh, local initiatives going on, but also national initiatives that um, the, the federal government is encouraging and supporting not only the Black community, but a lot of diverse groups to receive the resources, grant funding um, to empower themselves. So um, you can definitely find that information online. That's great. And you touched on a, a really important subject on social media here, because in the resources that we've developed through the All of Us Research Program and NLM, we, we haven't incorporated a lot on social media as it can, um, as Julio had presented, there's a lot of misinformation that is, is out there on these networks. Just based from your experience, and this opens up to both, you know, Alicia and Julio, are there some quick examples, um, organizations that you would encourage communities to follow and participants to follow um, on these social media networks? Are there some specific examples you can give? If, if I can start, like, the big issue, that's precisely the big issue, who? That's why I emphasize that probably the local level works better because I would say within these networks, there is like some kind of authority that is being constructed within the network. And that's, that's where all this uh, misleading information may come through. So you need to counteract that in the same playing field, like at the local level, uh, the person who is uh, connected to the community. I would say in the Latino community, probably like example, I'm, I'm living in Madison, Wisconsin. So there is a Latino Health Council that is constructed this network of people, of radio programs, of a website, of a Facebook that is like reaching out to the people directly. I would say that that probably works better. 
that having like an organization like the CDC or something at the national level like portraying that information that information for for people that's something that is also very common in the latino community is the idea of the promotoras de salud like health promoters that they, it's like a people who are within the community it's not the doctors or anybody within the community that has been have been trained into how to distribute this information throughout their networks and that is like that personal level, that personal kind of connection to that person. I think it works better than this like a big messaging at a national level. I don't know, maybe probably that's an idea that we can be working on. Absolutely. I, I do agree with Julio. Being more uh, community focused and uh, taking one community at a time is always the best approach. Um, within those communities, um, you can think about the Greek organizations that are predominantly participated by uh, Black um, communities, such as, you know, the uh, Delta sororities. And there, I mean, there, there's so many there's AKAs out there. There's, there's a lot of these Greek organizations founded or established on these historically Black colleges and universities where they have initiatives out there where they do community-based work, in, including health-based work. But then nationally, you also have the um, National Black Leadership Commission on Health. You have the African American Wellness Project um, that you can align yourself with, collaborate with to get resources that have already been curated. Um, and, and sometimes they have community advocates that work one-on-one -on -one with, with individuals looking to participate in the work. So there are national organizations that have been rather consistent Consistent, but staying at the community level would definitely be um, what I think we both would recommend. <laughs> yes. That's great. Thank you for providing that um, insight and focusing on the local point of getting information and connecting with your local organizations. We had another comment um, question come in. It says, I heard a segment on NPR that IMs are helping with the I think it's IMs, are helping with the vaccination effort with Muslims. Have you seen similar success in the Black and Latinx communities with religious leaders? Do you think they are crossing their boundaries as spiritual leaders? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think that um, I don't think it's necessarily crossing the boundary as a spiritual leader. I think it's important for spiritual leaders also to acknowledge that uh, there's a, a real world out there that we have to um, acknowledge and, and take information from that world um, as it pertains to our lives, our individual lives and our health. I think it's important for these religious leaders that do want to participate in this work to present all sides um, because there's not gonna be individuals all the time that agree with, uh, for instance, uh, being vaccinated with the COVID vaccine. Sometimes, you know, that's just implicitly not something that they believe um, or that that uh, particular religion ascribes to. So I do think I think if a religious leader does want to uh, disseminate information, it's important to not only disseminate information uh, as it pertains to your particular religious view, but also disseminate all the information out there so that your um, your community can make a decision uh, based on the knowledge that they have, the information, the accurate information that they've been given so that they can make the decision for themselves. I think it's a breach of that trust when um, it, it, there's a stigma placed on having faith or um, acknowledging medicine as a uh, responsible um, means to uh, improve your health or to um, uh, have impact on morbidity or, or sickness in the community. I think that's kind of a line you want to stay away from. But I think it's great to have religious leaders be a part of the conversation because they are people too. And so they, they should have an opinion and share, but it's very important for them to take their responsibility and share all of the information rather than anything filtered through um, a biased point of view. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would uh, just to add to that, that we also need to take into account that uh, all this uh, health information has been has becoming, especially with COVID, very ideological in nature. So we cannot, the fact that a religious leader is uh, promoting health information doesn't mean that it's the, 
information that probably maybe or we want to be promoted because they, all this is filtered through a lot of ideological and political filters so i i i think this is the idea that uh, we need to help people look for information like be able to be more critical with the information they receive and make decisions on their own because i, I don't think it we can push it into the idea of like somebody like a, basically kind of like a leading people into getting vaccinated, for example, if that person doesn't have the trust of being vaccinated. I think it's better just to, even if it takes more effort and time, to build that person into being able to read that information and make that decision for themselves. And I think this idea of religious leaders, it plays into this same field. Like how you cannot impose people to uh, your own view of healthcare. You have to give the people the correct information so they make their own decisions and they can use their own agency to do that. So I, I think we need to be yes, careful with that because there is not... Many times when we talk about a religious leader, we take like the idea of like an universal truth. Mm -hmm. And when it relates to healthcare, certainly it's, it doesn't apply there. That's great. Yep. Thank you both for your comments on that question. And, and I wanna um, just say that we have about one more minute here to leave it open for any additional questions if you wanna get those in. If you want, I would just like make a quick comment to just to fill the, the void. Uh, <clears throat> there, I, I, I heard there were like some uh, comments about the Tuskegee project and all this. And I, I think it's important to point out that this pertains to all of our communities because at the same time, Tuskegee started in the 30s and lasted until the 70s. Right after World War II, uh, the US was uh, performing experiments with syphilis in Guatemala with a very cooperating dictator in which people were actually infected with syphilis and uh, they were like treating at different stages just to see what goes on because it was important for the army to know those soldiers that get infected, what the best treatment was. So this also plays out in this field of imperialism in a sense and trust even if it's not as direct as the African-American community in Tuskegee, that is like the overarching example of that. All across Latin America, we have these examples in which healthcare is also tied to ideas of imperialism and imposition and basically experiment. And in that we share all this, the same feeling of trust and the need to portray a message like build on trust. Yeah, trust is so important, Julio. And and I, Willisha, I know you talked about this as well. And taking the time to really research who you're talking to, the communities you want to get involved in, where you want to make a difference, and not just um, have this immediate intervention. We're going to make this happen. Um, it it really is not an an overnight job and and task. It's something that you need to be dedicated to and take time. So absolutely, thank you for, for just mentioning that and reminding us of how important it is to do our research and do our part in building that trust with the communities that we support um, to make a difference in making health decisions. So with that, um, we are just about at the, the new hour here. I wanna turn it back over to Britt to do our final remarks and wrap up. And thank you again, everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks to you.
<laughs> Caitlin, thank you so much for moderating today's presentation. And Alicia and Julio, thank you so much for presenting on addressing health literacy with African-American and Latinx communities. To all of our live audience members, we wanna thank you for attending the presentation, which is part two in our four part webinar series on tips and tools for closing the digital divide. And we hope you will join us tomorrow to hear from Eric Johnson, foreign language and adult literacy librarian from Milwaukee Public Library and Jaron Totten, social outreach coordinator and legislative advocacy specialist from LGBT plus Detroit. This program was made possible in partnership with the National Library of Medicine the network of the National Library of Medicine and the National Institute's All of Us Research Program. Before you go, we welcome your feedback on this program. A survey link is available to you in the chat and your responses will help us continually improve our programming. Thank you and see you tomorrow. <laughs>